And so today, I get to go into the fun stuff. You know, there's not really a lot of fun stuff in the Revelation besides the fact of understanding and knowing that it's coming. It just means we're that much closer to the final stages of God setting up his kingdom here on earth as he always intended it to be. And so today, we're going to be getting into the book of Revelation chapter 13. Are you ready? Are you ready? Who is that? Are you ready? (laughs) What is that? Huh? Oh, yeah, are you ready to rumble? How did I forget that? That's Michael Buff- Buffer or something like that, right? And you see his brother in the UFC doing it. But let's get ready. You know, that's what he says. Let's get ready to rumble. That's what he says, right? So tonight we're going to be talking about, we're going to just take chapter 13. Next week we're going to take 14 and 15. We'll probably be able to do mostly two, maybe even two and a half chapters from here on out, except for one week where we'll just touch on one chapter. But this week I wanted to just take time with chapter 13 because this is the absolute introduction of the Antichrist. And so we want to really take time with this, look at this, because it's not just for the end times. Understanding the Antichrist's tactics, who he is, his characteristics, will help us also now in our current time to be able to discern between the spirits, right? Because the spirit of the Antichrist is evident and at work right now. Satan is already at work today at this hour, already introducing the world to the spirit of Antichrist. He's been at work of it, at it since Christ was born, right? Jesus, the Bible said that Man, right, will have his heel bruised by Satan, but his heel then will turn and crush Satan's head. And so Satan has been doing his best to be able to set up. We talked about it today. You know, one of my small groups that I lead and and have an honor and pleasure to be a a part of is we have a a group of men that we meet on uh, Wednesday afternoons twice a month, and we just discuss you know, some, some ironing, sharpening, ironing subjects, how to be a better man of God, how to be a better husband, how to be a better leader in God's kingdom. And with that said, today we talked about Satan is very strategic. We should never underestimate him. You know, I caution, like Jesus did to his disciples, Christians from, you know, making fun or poking fun at Satan or acting like he's just a, a little imp underneath your foot. You know, that's not the truth. To tell you the truth, he's incredibly powerful. He's very, very uh, good at what he does. He's been at it for thousands and thousands and thousands of years with humanity. We don't fear him. We understand that by the blood of Christ and the God living within us, that we are overcomers over him, but it's like walking into a, a boxing match and underestimating the opponent, right? You never want to do that. Mike Tyson did that with Buster Douglas, and he ended up on his butt, right? So we don't want to do that. We don't want to underestimate the, the enemy, but we also, we don't want to give him more authority and power than he really has because through Christ, we have all the power and authority that we need, right? All right, so with that said, we're going to be getting into chapter 13 from the book of Revelation. We're going to pray before we read that. Just as a quick recap, uh, I'm going to do it very quick tonight. We're not going to use the PowerPoint because I need to whiz through it so we have time to really dig into 13. But we basically know that in the very beginning of the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3, that God promises us, Jesus promises those that will hear the book of Revelation, who read the book of Revelation, and who do the book of Revelation, that there is a special blessing that has been set aside for those kind of people. So tonight, we should expect to receive a special blessing as we are readers, hearers, and doers of the book of Revelation. And then we go on through chapters 2 and 3 to learn about the seven spirits of the seven churches, that there are seven spirits, seven spiritual atmospheres of the churches. Some of those, two of those, God didn't have a single word of correction for, right? Sardis and and Philadelphia, he had no words of correction for, but for the four of the seven, he had words of correction for, but six of the seven, he had words of commendation. Good job. This is what you've done great. And then there was just one little booger, right? That, 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 that just, he didn't have one single thing to say good about 
this spirit of the church, and that was Laodicea. It's the lukewarm church. It's the church that wants to try to mimic the world and mimic God at the same time. And Jesus said he's going to vomit that kind of spirit out of his mouth because he wants nothing to do. He'd rather have you living straight up buck wild for the devil or living on fire for him, right? He don't want nobody playing games. All right, is that too raw? Somebody help me. Just, just throw, throw something at me if I, if I get too loose tonight, all right? But this is, this is, the, this is the, the, the principle that we are going to be a church that's on fire for God. Amen? We're not going to be some, some lukewarm, some sissified, watered-down version of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to take a stand for what the Word of God says. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that we beat everybody in the head with a Bible and that we just, you know, we're critical and we're judgmental? No, it means nothing like that. What it means is because the Word says not to do those things, right? The churches that take pride, we're not going to be watered down. We're going to be on fire for God. We're going to burn everybody in our path with the fire and brimstone of God. That, then they... They, they're contradicting themselves because that's Satan's job, right? Satan's job is to be an accuser of the brethren, to be a critical spirit into people. That's not God's job. God sees the best in people. God sees the potential in people. God's love cannot be separated from people. Are you with me tonight? So we want to be a true, authentic, real church, and I believe the best example of the church that we could follow is the church of Philadelphia, the church that Christ loved, right? He didn't have one bad word to say about him, that he just was so encouraged courage by their love for him. He said their strength was little. You know, they may not have overtaken the entire world, but their their truth of their spirit was right on with him, and that was love. And that worst case scenario is what we are going to do. And so then we learned about the tough stuff that starts to happen. And I'm just going to break it down uh, very quickly. There was seven trumpets, seven seals, seven trumpets, and we're into the seven bowls, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of judgment that are poured out upon the earth. And during that time, we know that half of the world's population in total will be wiped out from a world war, from a great famine, right? And, and, and also from all of these natural calamities like asteroids hitting the earth. You know, I think I told you guys that in 2004, I was preaching, you know, about this uh, whole end time revelation. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I was watching on Discovery Channel was that there was an asteroid headed for the earth that was due to hit earth in 2011 or 2012 if it did not change its its trajectory, it was going to impact earth. And that is something that is going to happen during the seven years of trials and tribulation. A big, huge asteroid is going to hit the earth, going to cause a lot of damage. And I was talking about that, and then I seen this on TV like the next day, and I was like, holy schmoly, the world's ending in 2011 slash 12. And so I woke up this morning about about 6 o'clock this morning, I'm reading the USA Today. Uh, I'm reading the USA Today like this because on my iPhone. I don't know why I do that. I'm Italian, and I kind of have a habit of doing that. But I was reading the USA Today, and then it said that this asteroid that I learned about seven years ago is going to come the closest to Earth as any asteroid ever has but it's not hitting us. It changed its direct trajectory, and I think it's like in the end of November time frame that they're going to be able to study this asteroid as it comes by. It's going to be the closest encounter to Earth that man knows of at least, right? And so I was like, hallelujah, thank Jesus. All right, so we're, we're good for at least another seven years, all right? So, there, but there's all kinds of stuff that's going to take place during the Earth that there's going to be, the grass is going to get burned up, the trees, one-third of all, the trees are going to get burned up, that the great famine strike strikes. It's hard to find water. It's hard to find food. It's just a really, really tough time happening. Volcanoes are erupting. Massive earthquakes are happening. The world war, a nuclear holocaust. I mean, it's just a really, really tough time that takes place upon the earth. And then all of these evil spirits are released. Apollyon, the destroyer, is released from the abyss, and him and his army strike the earth with plagues, and it's really, again, a tough time. It says people will be brought unto the point of death but not allowed to die. We know that the two witnesses are going to rise up, and they're going to operate in such supernatural power that it's going to put the world at awe. There's going to be 144,000 super witnesses out of Jerusalem, out of Israel, that are going to rise up, 12,000 from each tribe, and they're going to start rocking the world 
world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And between the two witnesses and the 144,000, more people will be brought to Christ during this really tough time on the earth than ever recorded in the history of man. The Bible says there'll be so many that no eye can even perceive or count the masses that will be saved. So that's a good thing that's coming out of it. But for those that still refuse to listen It just gets tougher and tougher and tougher here on earth. And then last week, you learned about some woman running around the wilderness, some dragon chasing her with a tail, and seven or or one-third stars are following him. And you learned about all that craziness, right? And and, and in the end, there's a bunch of different theories out there, you know, and, and, and we just, we kind of talk about all of them. We give our opinion and leave the rest up to you. Okay? Is that a good enough recap? We there? All right, we're going to pick up right in chapter 13. I, I printed this out on paper today, uh, mainly so I don't lie from the, from the pulpit because I lost my Bible. So pray, pray for me that I find my Bible. Because two weeks or three weeks ago, I lost my iPad. I preached from my iPad on Sunday mornings. I preached from my Bible on Sunday or Wednesday nights, and I lost my iPad a few weeks ago. You guys must have prayed for me because I found it the next day, and now I lost my Bible. I've been looking for it all day. It's somewhere. Uh, it's you know, it's somewhere, and, and God will help me find it with your prayers. Thank you. So I'm going to be preaching. I got a. I got a uh, a Bible with me, but I'm going to be preaching from this paper so I can write all my notes all over it and doodle and Google and all that stuff. All right, here we go. Verse 1 of the book of Revelation, chapter 13. This is titled, The Beast Coming from the Sea, and we are about to learn about the Antichrist rising up into power on the earth. Before we do that, we're going to pray for this blessing. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together tonight to be able to study, to be able to read, to be able to hear, and to walk out of here and do the Word of God. Lord, your Word declares a special blessing upon our lives when we study this book out. I pray that blessing will come upon each and every person present tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, verse 1. And the dragon stood, the dragon is Satan, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast come up out of the sea. Now let's preface some things here. Remember what the sea represents in Bible prophecy? It represents the masses of humanity. So when he says he saw the beast rising up out of the sea, it's not literally rising up out of water, but he's coming up out of people. In other words, he is an elected, respected official here on earth that the people say, we want him to lead us. This is the Antichrist coming up. So he comes up out of the sea, and he has, he's a freaky deaky looking thing. He has 10 horns, seven heads on his horns, or 10 crowns. On his head were blasphemy, on his seven heads were blasphemous names, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His body was like a leopard, his feet were like those of a bear, his mouth is like that of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. Okay? So here we got this really odd looking creature that has the body of a leopard, the, the paws of a bear. The mouth of a lion has ten horns with ten crowds and seven heads. Go figure that one out. Draw that up and send it to me on email after you scan it and don't scare me too much with it. Okay? This creature is not really looking like this in the natural. This is the supernatural figure of the creature. Remember our our interpretation rule? When something makes plain sense, try to seek no further sense, but when it's making no sense, then you seek further sense, and this makes no sense, right? A a body of a leopard, paws of a bear, you know, seven heads, ten crowns. What in the world is all of this? But we know through Bible prophecy, and I'll break these things down a little bit tonight, what these represent, okay? The, The ten horns, horns in Bible prophecy, they represent authority, okay? They represent authority, and the crowns represent kingdom, So we know that when he comes into power, he is elected and pushed to power by this. There's going to be ten kingdoms upon this world, okay? There's going to be ten very powerful, the ten most leading, most powerful kingdoms, nations upon this world. He is going to come up out of them, and he is going to represent them. So we start to see now the formation of the first 
one world government that will rule the world, okay? And so he's coming up out of this, so that's what the ten horns are the ten nations, the ten kings that he is representing. The seven heads, the seven heads are the seven phases of Roman government or the seven kings. There's a lot of, you know, input into this from a lot of different Bible scholars, and in the end, I believe this is where I stand. If we look back at the Roman Empire, there were seven phases of the Roman Empire. And as we'll talk here in a little bit, the Antichrist will be brought up in the Gresham Empire moment. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. I'll explain that. But he is going to most likely be coming out of that Roman Greek kind of area, vicinity, out of the Mediterranean Sea kind of vicinity. And so he's coming up, and watch this, he has seven heads, those seven heads being the seven phases of government, the seven uh, uh, kings, per se, out of that government that are going to be the hierarchy. And then watch this, and on his head, and on his heads were blasphemous names. What in the world is all that about is this, is that each name is going to blaspheme the authority of God. When the Antichrist rises up into power, this is Satan's, he's flexing his muscles basically by promoting his man to be the the God and the king of the entire world, right? And so these are just blasphemy God. Verse two, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like those, uh, like the mouth of a lion. Let me clarify some things here and I'll give you some scripture. The leopard in Daniel chapter 7 verse 6 and in Daniel chapter 8 verses 20 through 23. The leopard was referred to as Daniel. He was referring to the Grecian empire as a leopard. What is the Grecian empire? It is the, 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 the Greek empire for our modern day vernacular. It was the Greek empire led by none other than Alexander the Great. Okay, so when he's referring to the body of the leopard, this is why we have the understanding that this man is coming up out of that whole Grecian Empire, the whole empire that was made up by the Greeks, Alexander the Great leading that empire. The lion, or I'm sorry, the bear, the bear is coming out of Persia. The bear in Daniel 7 verse 5 represented the Persian Empire, and Daniel 7 4, represent, he represents the Babylonian Empire with the lion, okay? So what we see here is that there's gonna be this collaboration of all of the former, if you don't know anything about too much about history, but these three empires that we talked about, the Roman Empire, the Russian Empire, however you wanna look at it, it's still the same thing. You know, it's, it's one of those, you know, they called it the Roman Empire, but it was the Greeks, right? running the world, but it's called the Roman Empire because they based it in Rome because that was before Italy was truly Italy, all right? So we got the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, and then we've got the Persian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. When you look back at history, other than America, these are the three most dominant empires to ever rule the the world. Each one of these empires at one time took over the world. They ran a one world system, a one world government. Alexander the Great set out to conquer the entire world, right? So the, and they were successful at doing it. Okay, Hitler tried to do so in a very obnoxious way, but he didn't, he didn't turn out to be so successful once we got involved. So these three empires, that's why he looks like he does, because he's about to establish the one world government. He's drawing in the power from all of these great, great historical uh, nations and what they did. Okay, so the beast like a leopard, uh, his body was, hands like, feet like a bear, and his mouth like a lion. Verse, and then watch this now. And the dragon, which is Satan, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority, okay? So Satan gives the Antichrist great power, gives him his throne, and gives him great authority. Now, what is Satan's power? What is his throne? And what is his authority? We know that the Bible says that the throne, the seat of Satan, the throne of Satan is located in Turkey, right? But Satan, the Bible says, is the God of this world, okay? So his authority is limited 
to this world. So that authority over the world is given into him, over the people of the world. Do you understand what that means? So Satan has now been given authority. He's given his authority to the Antichrist to to rule the world. And then he's also given him the authority over the world's system. Okay? And then he's given him power. What is that power? This is what I was referring to earlier. I don't want anybody in here to be deceived by uh, that Satan is some chump. Okay? He's a very, very powerful being. We don't want to bring honor to him. We don't want to worship him. We don't want to give him too much credit. But at the same time, we have to understand that, you know, do you remember when the disciples went out and they tried to cast out some devils and they got the snot knocked out of them and they came back to Jesus and said, it didn't work. And he said, oh, by the way, dude, you, you, you got to fast for these ones. You know what I mean? Like uh, maybe I should have told you that in the beginning, but maybe not. It's good for you to learn on your own, you know, that you can't go in to certain situations and just think that you've got this without the power of Christ really radiating and you being obedient to what God says. Do you know, and this is, I'm kind of going to go on a little tangent here because, you know, the, the, there's a lot of questions out there. Are psychics real? Are medians real? Uh, you know, is, is, is there really any truth in the tarot cards and in the zodiac signs and, and all this stuff? And I'm going to say that yes, is it real? Yes, but it's a real fake of the real thing. Do you follow what I'm saying? Satan cannot create. All he has done is imitate, twist, and pervert the truth. But he has power. And I'll give you a story that freaked me out, still kind of freaks me out to this day, but you could read it for yourself. Do you remember once Saul betrayed David three times? You know, and, and, and he tried to kill David three times, and David could have killed him when he was uh, kind of relieving himself, taking a number two in the cave, you know. Just to be honest, that's what he was doing, okay. He was, you know, taking care of business, and David was there, and he could have killed him. His men said to do it, but the Holy Spirit, God spoke to him and said, don't do it, right? Then there was the other time where he was sleeping and he took his jug and he took his, you know, so all this stuff happening and listen to this because this is very interesting, but Saul prayed to God because here's what happened is David ended up aligning with the Philistines. Remember this? He was living in, in the Philistines area because he was basically, you know, vanquished from being able to live in, in Israel. And so he's living in the Philistines area. And David was a tricky dude because he was going in and he was plundering all of the Palestinian, you know, which is now modern day Palestine, but all the Philistine camps, he was going in and he was plundering them, but he was wiping them out to where the, 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 the Philistines never knew that he was doing it, right? But then he sided with the Philistines, and he was going to go to war against Israel, but then God stopped that from happening. But Saul still heard of it. It's going to happen. Are you with me? When that happened, because this is a really freaky story. When this happens, Saul prays to God. God should we go to war? He called for the eunuch, you know. Uh, he, 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 he called for what back then was basically the Holy Spirit, the representation of the Holy Spirit to get God's confirmation. Should we go on this? Should I have peace at doing this? And God said, I refuse to answer you for the way that you have treated my servant David. Now, any king back then never went to war without having God's blessing because it meant they would lose. So do you remember what Saul did? He dressed up. You know, he, he, he cloaked himself to where you could not tell he was a king. Nobody knew he was King Saul. And he went and he saw a median. And he asked the median to call forth the prophet Samuel's spirit from paradise. And do you know that Samuel's spirit got called out of paradise and showed up on the spot? And do you remember how ticked off Samuel was? Like, who in the world is calling me out of paradise back into this world? What business do you have with me? You know, so think about this for a second. A median is not from God. It's clearly shown in the word of God. That's a form of witchcraft. But yet, this median had enough power to be able to call forth a spirit from the dead. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So is our psychics real? Yeah, I believe they are. I believe that they're operating under the power of Satan. I believe that their gifting is to be a prophet. That's what God put within them. Satan has perverted that, and now they've become a median or a, or a tarot card reader or a palm reader or you know a typical psychic or whatever that is. I believe in what they're doing, that, it, that it has, it's real, but I don't believe in what they're doing. 
Does that make sense? So we don't want to discount, because that's where we sound really stupid and goofy, you know? As Christians, when we say, oh, that stuff ain't real. But the world says, yeah, it is, man, because they're, they're, the police departments are now using psychics to find missing persons, and it's working, right? So when we discount that and just say, oh, it ain't real, it's not real, it doesn't exist, you know, it, 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 it makes us look foolish because what backing do we have to say it's not real when it is working? It's effective. And that's what's going to happen with the Antichrist when he is given Satan's full authority, his throne, and his power. He's going to be able to operate in great signs and wonders. And we're going to read about that here in just a few minutes. Okay? So I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. We learned about that earlier in the Revelation that the Antichrist, he's going to be assassinated before he comes into power, and he's going to be raised from the dead. Tell me Satan don't have power, right? He's going to be raised from the dead so that he comes back alive and brings the world at awe. He's going to become a hero to this world. They're going to really believe in him and love him. And I saw one of his heads that had been slain, and his fatal wound had been healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast, which is the Antichrist. They worshiped the dragon, Satan, because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? Does that sound familiar? Do you remember when John first saw the lamb in heaven, and the elders and the angels are singing, Who is worthy? To be, who is worthy to open this scroll, who is like the lamb that can, that can have the authority and the place to be able to do this. So we already see the perversion starting happening when people are worshiping the Antichrist like we are called to worship Jesus. There was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle that is those who dwell in heaven. Okay? So here he is talking all kinds of smack about God. Why is he doing that right now? In verse or chapter 12, what do we learn? We learned that Satan, you know, I think Pastor Don did a great job at doing this. It, it's not something... You know, Satan was cast out of heaven when, when, when he revolted against God, right? When he came against God, he was cast out of heaven. But he still has access to heaven to this hour, right? And he's going there to be the accuser of the brethren. He's going there to try to bring accusations against God's people, okay? But at the, at the three and a half year mark, the midway point of the seven years of trials and tribulation, God's just done with the nonsense. It's time to bring this thing to a close. And there's a war that happens with Michael and his angels and Satan and the fallen angels, and they are cast out of heaven to be allowed no more access unto God's throne. So now they don't have any more access. Now Satan is mad as mad can get, right? Because what does he love to do? He loves to lie, and he loves to accuse us. That's the two things he loves to do, and he can't lie about us in his accusing, his accusations about us to God anymore. So now he raises up his man to be able to do it under the world, right, to be able to take this stuff. He's arrogant. He's blasphemy. He's a loud mouth. He thinks he's got it all together, right? So he's Satan's mouthpiece, upon the world, and he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is those who dwell in heaven. So who is his tabernacle? We are his tabernacle, right? We know that we are the tabernacle. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he is blaspheming God and everybody that has believed and been saved and redeemed to him. Okay? Verse 7 It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. What does that mean? To overcome them, it means to overcome them. He's now taking authority and power over them. He is now starting to run the world. And authority, watch this, over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. So this scripture 
is where we get the one world government from. The one world government won't be a coalition of every nation. It'll be these 10 nations that come together and that the Antichrist is the head of and they rule the world. Whether you like it or not, they rule the world. Okay? And every, he's given authority over every tribe, over every tongue, over every nation. So every nation on the earth will be under his authority, right? But that doesn't mean they like it. Do you, do you understand? When, when Roman Empire took over the world, not everybody liked it. You know, Israel didn't like being underneath the Roman Empire. They just couldn't do anything about it. All right? So it doesn't mean that everybody comes in alignment with him. It just means that he has so much authority and power that you don't have a choice, that you have to be underneath his authority. Okay? So there'll be one world and one world system. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. So every single, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Again, we talked about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Here's another scripture to me that just fully shows me it's pre-tribulation because all is all, right? And how are we worshiping the Antichrist and then all of a sudden getting redeemed after we've already been redeemed after we've already been redeemed? Do you follow what I'm saying? So this is not us. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for the captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here's what he's saying. You're going to get in the end, folks, what we deserve, not us but humanity, you know? We, we've not turned our heart to God, humanity. You, you know, we, we are in heaven, so let's stop saying we, they, whoever, people, have not turned their heart to God. They have resisted him even through all of this stuff that's taking place on the earth. They refuse to accept his love. We are talking about today, me and one of our, our, our leaders of the church, we're sitting down looking at one of our ministries and, and, and looking how can we make it better, how can we make it stronger, how can we be better for you guys. And as we were doing that, you know, we talked about, you know, this is great. You know, God, Jesus' vision, his purpose is to overtake this world. That's why he came, right? He came to overcome the world, right? And so he left us Christians, people, believers, those that will be redeemed by him. He left us all authority and all power over the earth. His expectation of us through the Great Commission is to go into the world and take this thing over. Now, that's not by force. That's not by violence. It's by love. But, but who is really overtaking the world? There's more Muslims than Christians, right? There's more Buddhists now than Christians, so who's really overtaking the world? The Muslims are taking it over by force, right? By violent force, by, by not even just take away the violent section of that. They're taking it over. They are propaganda. I mean, you look at the, what, where Muslim stretches. If you ever look at one of those religious globes, you know, and you see the different colors of what the different religions. Man, they're taking over the entire Middle East and even sweeping. When I go to Sweden... To, to what used to be a Christian nation, if you look at Sweden's flag, it has the cross of Christ on the flag. They now, they now are 1.3% Christian. And there's something like 30% Muslim. You know, I mean, they're taking over. I, me, me and this gentleman were discussing, man, if we had the same passion and devotion, as think about what a Jehovah Witness. How many guys got your doors knocked on by Jehovah Witness, right? Go away. You know, I'm just teasing. Don't do that. That's rude. Don't do that. Just, yeah, hey, how you doing? Good, good seeing you. No, thanks. Bye. All right, and then close the door. But, but how many of us have had our door knocked on by a Jehovah Witness? You know, these are people that believe something that's, that's really crazy. They believe that only 144,000 are going to heaven, but there's millions of them. So, like, the rest of you are screwed, but 144,000 are in and there's been millions of them. But they just, for whatever reason, man, they believe in what they believe, and they are taking it to our doorstep. 
Do you follow what I'm saying? And we as Christians, not us at Reach Church, but we as Christians as a whole, we just keep waiting on the rapture. Oh, it's coming any time now. We're about to be out of here. And we've been doing that for centuries. And we've been waiting on Jesus to save us when he has been waiting on us to help him save the world. Do you follow what I'm saying? And that's what our heart is. That's what I said Sunday morning. It's not us four no more. That's not the mentality of Reach Church. We want every seat filled. I want to run four and five services in this building before we have to be forced to go buy a bigger one or build one. You know, and then when we fill that one up, we'll plant campuses all over the city. And when we plant it as many as we could possibly plant, we'll plant some more. And when we've done that, then we'll start hitting Houston and Dallas. And are you hearing what I'm saying? This is not, this is not, Jesus doesn't think so small. He came to give his life for the world, right? And we are the ambassadors. We are the messengers. We are the deliverers. And if we have the same dedication, devotion, and discipline, what? because here's the truth. What's the Jehovah Witness message? Only 144,000 are going to heaven. How many are you? Millions. Crap. I don't want to be a part of that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be a part of that. You know? Buddhist, I'm, not, I'm just telling you, I don't have a problem. You know, how, you know my heart. My heart is love, you know, but I'm never going to ever even act like it's okay for any other religion to be cool. Jesus is the only way. God is the only God, right? So with that said, Buddhists, they believe in a really, you know, heavy guy that just has a lot of love around him, right? They believe in a dude that's dead, They believe he's dead. They know he's dead, but they believe he is their God. Muslims, they believe in a God, but they believe in a salvation through Muhammad who is dead. D-E-A-D. Dead. Right? We, We have this amazing God who loves us like crazy, loves us so much that he gave his one and only son that we can be redeemed. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to get it all to right and all together. We just got to accept and receive his love and we're in, right? That's a pretty good message. That's an amazing, um, our message kicks their message butt, right? You know what I mean? Like we, our message is the greatest message and it just so happens to be the truth. You know what I mean? And so if we would just, like this is the one part of me that just, you know, wants to just lay hands on certain Christians, you know, in a good way, and just encourage them and tell them this is not about us. This is about the world. And we are a part of that, so we are in the equation, but it's not just us about us. And I see stuff like this, some man rising up and having so much influence that he can rule the world, you know, and and he's false, he's fake, he's going to get his when the time is, when his time is done. But what could we do with the greatest message? It's a message about love, about acceptance, about forgiveness, right? About tolerance, right? Uh, 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 About, you know, you're a baby, It's cool to drink milk. As you get older, you should put away those childish things. How simple is that? Hey, you ain't got to get it all right, but if you're still doing the same thing you're doing 10 years ago, man, grow up, you know, take the diaper off, get the binky out of your mouth, right, and start learning how to eat some food. But but that's that's stuff that we can deal with as we go along with it. To get in, all we've got to do is accept the greatest sacrifice ever made. Isn't that a great message? I think it's a great message. All right, let's move on. Or was it? <laughs> just, just keep doing what you was doing. All right, here we go. Where's that? Verse seven. We're going to read it again because I don't know where I was at. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and overcome them, and the authority over every tribe, over every people, over every tongue, nation given to him. Verse eight. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written in the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, the captivity goes. We talked about that. You get, in the end, what you deserve, okay? So this is the Antichrist. I'm going to read some parallels, all right? So I'm going to read some contrast 
some contrasting parallels if that's possible. I think that's an oxymoron, but it, it fits what I'm about to say. I'm going to give you 14, 14 things the Bible says Jesus is and how 14 things the Bible says the Antichrist is, which absolutely contradicts who Jesus is. You ready for that? Okay. Number one, Christ came from above. That's John 6:38. I'll just I'll just sell tell you the scripture afterwards so I don't have to use a lot of words. Christ came from above, John 6:38. Antichrist ascends from the pit, Revelation 11:7. See the contrast? Boom. Number 2, Christ came in his father's name, John 5:43. The Antichrist come from his own name, comes in his own name. And that is, where's that at? John 5, 43, yeah. Three, Christ humbled himself, Philippians 2, 8. Antichrist will exalt himself, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Four, Christ was despised, Isaiah 53, 3. Christ was despised. Isaiah 53, 3, and Luke 23, 18. The Antichrist will be admired, Revelation 13, 3 through 4. Five, Christ will be exalted, Philippians 2, 9. The Antichrist will be cast down into hell, Isaiah 14, 14, and Revelation 19, 20. It's actually Isaiah 14, 14 through 15. In Revelation 19, 20. Six, Christ came to do his Father's will. John 6, 38. Antichrist will come to do his own will. Daniel eleven thirty six. Seven, Christ came to save. Luke 19, 10. Antichrist came to destroy. Daniel 8, 24. Number eight, Christ is the good shepherd. John 10, 1 through 15. Antichrist is the idol shepherd, the evil shepherd. He's a false idol. That's Zechariah 11, 16 through 17. Number nine, Christ is the true vine. John 15, 1. Antichrist is the vine of the earth. Revelation 15. 14, 18. Number 10, Christ is the truth. Too short said that, didn't he, Doc? No, he didn't say that. Christ is the truth. It's in a rap song somewhere, I notice. John 14, 6. The Antichrist is a lie. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11. Number 11, Christ is the Holy One. Mark 1, 24. And the Antichrist is the lawless one. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 8. 12, Christ is the man of sorrows. Isaiah 53, 3. He bore our sorrows for our sake. Antichrist is the man of sin. Second Thessalonians 2, 3. 13, Christ is the son of God. Luke 1, 35. Antichrist is, is the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 as well. And last, number 14. Christ is the mystery of godliness. God manifested in the flesh. 1 Timothy three sixteen. The Antichrist will be the mystery of iniquity. Satan manifested himself in the flesh. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7. Okay? I'm going to whiz through this stuff. If you need the notes, I can give them to you, or you can get on the podcast and get them off there. Number one, listen to this. There are future activities of the Antichrist. Number one, he's going to rise into power. Two, he's going to open up a one-world government. Three, he'll dominate the world's economy. Four, he'll raise up an atheistic religion. They won't believe in a God. They'll believe in a man that believes that he is God. Number five, he'll come into covenant with Israel. That's found in Daniel 9, 27. He'll come into covenant with Israel. 
Number six, he'll die and resurrect. That's all through Revelation. We just learned about that here in chapter 13 as well. And number seven, he'll come to destruction. He'll come to destruction, which is 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. His time will come. Okay? Now we're going to go into verse 11. Verse 11, because now we switch. First we learned about the Antichrist. Now we're going to learn about the false prophet. The false prophet. Verse 11. Let me tell you about the false prophet. You can also hear about him in Matthew 24, 24. Jesus said, false Christs and prophets will deceive with great signs and wonders, and even the elect, listen to this, even the elect will be deceived. This is something that drives me to have as much accountability around me as I possibly can. I've got an oversight board of five church pastors that pastor mega churches, but then we've got internal committees and boards that we're putting. I want accountability around me because the elect, what they're referring to is the leaders of the church, and it says in the end, even the elect will be deceived. And so for a minute, if somebody thinks they've arrived and they can't be deceived, they've been deceived. Do you follow what I'm saying? And that's why, you know, I say a lot of things like this from the pulpit so that there's accountability even with our church because we are one people. I'm a brother and sister in Christ just like you, right? And I love you enough to watch after you. You should love me enough to watch after me. And if you ever hear some kind of nonsense, cockamamie stuff coming out of my mouth, then please, by all God, slap me in the face and wake me up right? Maybe not slap me first, just talk first. I might violently react. All right. All right, here we go. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. Now, the first one came out of the sea. The Antichrist came out of the sea, which is out of the masses of humanity. There's a lot of speculation about what will be the, uh, the nationality of the Antichrist, like we said, we believe he'll be Mediterranean, whether he's Greek or Roman or whatever. You know, this, some theologians believe him coming out of the earth is their, their representation, their mimicking, their perverting of God creating man from the earth, right? And so they believe he could well be Jewish or maybe Middle Eastern because that's where humanity began at, right? So who knows in the end, I don't know that it's incredibly important. We won't be here, but, you know, just in case, all right? And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. What is this? He looks like a lamb and speaks like a dragon. You ever hear that old school saying, the wolf in sheep's clothing? This is him. He looks like the lamb. He looks like the savior. He looks like somebody who is meek and humble, but he is speaking, Satan is speaking straight through him. He is speaking literally through, you know, with Satan's words, okay? He exercises, watch this now. He exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence. So he's exercising the authority of the Antichrist, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first beast whose fatal head was, uh, wound was healed. So here we got the, the false prophet is rising up. He is in the authority of the Antichrist, and he is making the world worship the Antichrist. How is he making him do that? We're going to talk about that towards the end of the chapter, okay? He performs great, great signs so that even he makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. Who do we know that is able to call fire down from heaven to earth? Elijah, the prophets, right? So here's the false prophet coming, making fire come down. He's performing great signs and wonders. The whole world is at awe. Verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound of the sword and who has come to life, okay? So here we have him now, they're creating an image, you know, an idol, an image for the world to worship, which is representing the Antichrist. In verse 15, and it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak 
and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Okay? So now he's got a speaking statue, right? He's got an image that's able to speak, and then the whole world is in awe, and anybody that does not choose to worship first is going to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of man, and his number is 666. Okay? So here's what's happening. The false prophet rises up. He operates at all these incredibly great signs and wonders, called fire down from heaven, creating the image to be worshipped of the, of the Antichrist that even has the ability to speak. Everybody's in awe or scared, you know, the daylight's right out of them. And in the middle of all of that, he is telling people now, remember we said he's going to make the entire world worship the Antichrist? Here's how he completes the mission is with the mark of the beast. Because rich, poor, small, great, free, slave, without the mark of the beast on their right hand or on their forehead, they are not able to buy or sell anything. Okay? What is that mark? The mark is 666. What is 666? How will it be on there? Will it be tattooed literally 666 like the Hells Angel biker dude? I don't know. You know what I mean? There's a lot of technology today. We talked about that, I think, earlier. There's a lot of technology today. You know that there is literally a little microchip now. They're even certain in animals. They're starting to put it in babies in uh, London, but there's in, in the UK. But there is a microchip that can be inserted underneath your skin right, that can carry all of your pertinent information, your identification, your banking, your social security, everything can be put on this thing, and it's found that the best place for it to survive within your body, because it needs some kind of energy, is in your right hand or in your forehead, because that's where the most lithium acid is concentrated in your body. Now, will it be that? I don't know. You know what I mean? I'm just going to tell you the truth, but it could be. I'll tell you another little thing, you know, is these barcodes. You know, have you ever seen this? If you look on here, there's, there's three barcodes that are identical. They bookend the ends, and then there's one in the middle that are identical. And those barcodes in numerical computer matrix mean 666. That They stand for the number six. And so is that it? Are you going to have a barcode? I don't know. Is the, is the chip going to have a barcode that's going to be, I, I have no idea. I'm just throwing some possibilities out there because it's, it's just absolutely fun to watch your faces when I do that, okay? And so that's something, that's, that's something that, that I, I don't know what exactly it is, but I know this, you will be marked, not you, they, people, will be marked, right? And without that mark, they will not be able to buy or sell anything, Okay? Why is the number? It says this, here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for there's the number of man, and his number is 666, so it's 666. Why six? Six is the number of man, which falls short of seven, which is the divine perfection of God, right? We are not perfect. We are made perfect as Christians by the blood of Christ that covers us. Do you know that you can't work to be righteous? that you are not righteous, that you are not righteous in your own self, but it is the blood of Jesus. You know, religion has taught us you gotta be righteous, you gotta, you gotta purify yourself. You gotta, and we should be purifying ourselves and we should be achieving and going to the next level and believing to reach the next goal. But in the end, we are imperfect beings, but we are made perfect by the sacrifice of Christ, right? So with that said, I want, I wanna, I wanna end and wrap it up with this, is why is there three numbers though? Why is there three sixes? Six, six, six. The number three means completion, okay? And another thing I want to show you is now we see, with the introduction of the false prophet, now we see, now we see the satanic trinity. 
There's Satan, right? The dragon. Then we have the Antichrist, the first beast, and the false prophet, the second beast. And let's look and see how perverted that is for the Holy Trinity. Because God the Father is not seen and cannot be seen by eye or we die, right? So we can't see the Father in his fullness of his glory. Satan is never seen in any real time on earth, right? He is a spiritual being that is unseen. He's trying to be like the Father. Now, the Antichrist is coming to save the world. He is perverted of the Christ. And the false prophet is the one who empowers him with great ability to work signs and wonders. What is the Holy Spirit's job? Is to empower Christ. Do you remember what Christ said in in Luke chapter 4? For the Holy Spirit has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, right? To, 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 to preach deliverance to the captives, bring recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who have been bruised, and to preach the acceptable jubilee year of the Lord. Do you understand that Jesus did nothing without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit? Do you remember when he went away for his 40-day fast leading into his ministry? What does it say? The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness on a 40-day fast, right? So Jesus did nothing without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and the Antichrist will be able to do nothing without the empowerment of his false prophet. So here is Satan's best job. He's going out with a bang, right? He wanted to be God in heaven, and that ended like a bolt of lightning. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. That didn't go go well for him. So in turn, what has he done? Is he He has infiltrated and turned God's prized creation against him as a, as a whole, as a greater majority against God. Humanity is mostly against God. We're working on that, but right now that's the way it is, right? And so in the end, now he's accusing us. He's going before God, trying to, trying to demise us. And in the end, halfway through, you're done, you're out, you're finished. Don't want to hear your mouth anymore. Your time is near. Your time is ending. It's coming soon. So now he's going out with a big old firework display. Okay, then, let me imitate what I know has been the most effective thing ever, and that is the Trinity, and I'm going to imitate that in myself, the Antichrist and the false prophet, right? So that is the satanic Trinity. That's why I believe those, those few things, 666, number of man, repeated three times, completion, as well as the imitation of the, satan- the satanic Trinity being the imitation of the Holy Trinity. We got it? So that is who the Antichrist is. And what I want to tell you guys as, as I wrap up, and we're going to go and close in a few worship songs, open up the altar if you need, just prayer in your life, courage in your life. This is the moment here that we're talking about when these things start to arise that we really, really begin and understand the, 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 the reflection. Satan has been doing his absolute best to mimic, to pervert, the truth. And do you know that he's doing that today in this hour? And do you know that any spirit that is against Christ is an anti-Christ spirit, right? So atheism and, 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 and Buddhist and Islam and all of these different things, they are against Christ. Anything that stands against Christ is the anti-Christ spirit. And that is something that we have to be aware of even today in this hour in the world that we live in, that we are fighting every day against this Antichrist spirit, that Satan is doing his very best. So we cannot compromise the truth because that's what he's trying to get us to do. If he can get the church, you remember what Jesus said, though, that I will build my church, not man, but him. He will build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, right? Doesn't mean that it's not going to be a war. Doesn't mean that we're not going to take our licks and our wounds. But I promise you this one thing. The church, she will rise. She will be glorious. She will overtake and overrun this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That will happen, folks, and I want to be a part of it. I want this church to be a part of it. I want this city to be a part of it. And we have to step up and be the ones that God has called us to be. Amen? Because there is the Antichrist spirit sweeping the earth. And how do we counter that? We counter it with the truth, with the spirit of the living God. And how do we get that? We get that from God's word. This is the truth. 
There is no other truth. Not your opinion about this. Do you hear me say it all the time? I can tell you my opinion when things aren't extremely clear, but in the end, I don't know. You know, I, I know what's important to know. I know that God loves me. I know that he gave his life, his son's life for me, and that his son gave me his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to empower me. And those three things, man, they're good enough for me, right? And I'm going to keep on keeping on standing on the truth and taking the truth into this world in love, right? In love. Do you think if we advertised Muslims stink and Buddhists suck and Jehovah Witnesses are loopy crazy and atheists are a bunch of insane morons and, and evolutionists are retarded. And, you know, if, if, do you think that if we advertise God's love like that to the world that we're going to be very effective? You know, we'll be great effectively swapping religious people. You know, we'll be a bunch of pew swappers. You know what I mean? But, but we won't be effective. We don't need to worry. We don't need to focus on the wrong things, right? We feel like we got this righteous indignation within us that we got to go out and we got to battle evil. We don't have to battle evil. Jesus already overcame evil. What we have to do is proclaim the truth because the truth conquers evil because the truth is sin. Does that make sense? So if we could focus, you know, I tell folks this all the time, even going through rough things, You know, me, Melissa, and Candace, you know, we've been through our share of tough times. We've been let down by the church. We've been backbitten. We've been talked about. We've been ripped off. We've had all those things happen to us. But instead of me putting my focus and energy on what happened to me, I want to put my focus and energy on what God is going to do with me, you know? And when I do that, when I do that, then everything else doesn't matter, you know? Are, Are you hearing me? And so it's the same principle when we take God's message If we will put our focus, if we will learn to put our focus on what God has called us to do, which is proclaiming his truth and love to all people, if we'll put our focus on there, then you don't have to worry. You know, the Muslim and the Buddhist and the atheist and the the Jehovah Witness, you know, they're going to be won over by the goodness of God and nothing else. You're not going to be able to sit down with them, folks. Well, my Bible says, and they'll say, well, my Bible says, My, my this says, and my that says. But when you win them over with the love of God and the power of God that's living within you, there's no denying. There's no denying that. We need to give them both education with experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen?